Over the last 30 years, there have been thousands of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects over the British Isles. You think I'm bloody daft, but this is a UFO. In the summer of 2008, reports of flying saucers and other crafts were capturing the headlines again. Over the years, numerous eyewitnesses, including military personnel, police officers and experienced airline pilots have testified to seeing strange lights in the sky and other mysterious phenomena. 12 o'clock, very bright yellow object. It was uh, nothing like an aeroplane that I'd ever seen before. It's the brightest light I've ever seen in my life. Many of these UFO sightings remain unexplained to this day. But what or who were they? Could they really be evidence of extraterrestrial life? It's a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. Oh, it's definitely coming this way. It was just something out of uh, a science fiction film. It was totally unbelievable. Tonight, we hear firsthand from those who witnessed them and examine the truth behind some of Britain's most celebrated UFO sightings. The remote Berwyn Mountains are the Welsh village of Llandrichlo. In 1974, the site of an infamous UFO encounter. My first thoughts were, wow, what was that? It was a very, very bright green light, different to anything I've ever seen before. Good God, he says, what happened there? I don't know. I don't know. But i never seen nothing like it. 99% it was a flame saucer. If a UFO did visit that night, has the story become shrouded in official secrecy? The government obviously did not want us to know what had happened. 34 years on, the story continues to intrigue. We were sat down watching television, uh, roughly about 20 to 9, as I mean, yeah, there was a, like a, th like a thud. And then the whole place started shaking you know, quite violently. It didn't last long, but it was very frightening. You know, we were just stunned and we were looking at each other and, and uh, I don't know, nobody said anything for a while, I don't think. Half a mile away, the village postmaster's house was also affected. We knew there was something wrong because my son was a bit agitated, you see, and he was, you know, he was on the verge of crying anyway. The shockwave hit the Berwyn mountain range and travelled four miles from Clandrichlo to the nearby town of Corwin. It sounded, to be honest, exactly like a steamroller coming up the road. Oof, it, it like hit the house, the settee tipped, and I landed up on the hearth. In the next valley, Police Sergeant Elvid Roberts was settling down for the evening. All of a sudden, I felt this ominous rumbling, and clearly something quite major had happened. And my first thoughts were, oh heavens, it's the dam. The Klinselin Dam holds 16 billion tons of water. Fearing it had been breached, Sergeant Roberts rushed to the scene. Having taken a moment to collect my thoughts and got in the car uh, and thought, right, I, I'm going to need to drive down towards Bala and see what I can discover. Had it been the dam that had burst, undoubtedly, 
the water would have engulfed the town by the time I had driven towards it, and it would have been a very major uh, tragedy. The more I drove towards Bala, the more reassured I became. So I then decided, well, I can rule that out with safety. So I drove then to the police station in Bala, and as soon as I went into the police station, the telephone was ringing, and it continued to ring each time I answered it, with reports coming in that something very big had happened. 999 calls were flooding in from the villages of Flandrichlo. The locals were alarmed. No one quite knew what was going on. Not only had their houses been shaken, they were seeing lights in the sky above them. We dashed out into the village square, and uh, of course there was a lot of people out there already. I looked up on the left-hand side of the shop, and we could see this ball of fire, which was quite bright, and uh, it sort of had a bit of a tail on, you see. We just saw it coming up, as if it was coming down at the back of the house, really. Of course, you know, it was frightening. Police Sergeant Roberts and Inspector Glyn Evans headed to the village to investigate. As we were driving, all of a sudden, we both saw this green light in the sky ahead of us. And it seemed to be an arcing light. But it was very sudden, totally unexpected, different to anything I've ever seen before, particularly because it was, it was this green arcing light with sort of blue tinges to the edges. The police didn't know what would confront them when they arrived at Clan Richlow, but January the 23rd, 1974, would be one of the longest nights in the village's history. Were these strange phenomena naturally occurring terrestrial events? or something otherworldly. I'm sure all the locals who can remember it would dearly love to find out exactly what it was. On January the 23rd, 1974, an explosion rang out and something shook the Berwyn mountain range in North Wales. After receiving dozens of 999 calls, police officers Elvid Roberts and Glyn Evans raced from their headquarters to the village of Llandrichlo. On their way, they'd seen what many of the villagers had also seen, a bright light arcing across the sky. We arrived in Llandrichlo. The whole village was out on the roadway. It was serious enough to get all the drinkers out of the local pub, the Dudley. And they all wanted to tell us what their experience was. Some of the villagers had seen a very large round bonfire, they described it as, upon Cater Bronwyn. With 24 of its peaks above 2,000 feet, the Berwins are notorious for air crashes. Just two years earlier, a military aircraft had come down in the area, and the police made an air accident their first line of inquiry. Had it been a crashed aircraft, perhaps there was an explosion somewhere, and that, that was the, the sort of arcing light from the explosion. To begin their search, the police needed to climb the mountainside, but they lacked a suitable vehicle to make the ascent. <laughs> They decided to call at the nearby Garethian farm, the home of 14-year-old schoolboy Hugh Lloyd and a four-wheel drive Land Rover. So knock on the door, there was a police officer there. He said uh, there was a, been a report of a plane crash. And uh, the actual words he said was, we'd like to commandeer your Land Rover. I remember that word. <laughs> I didn't quite actually know what it meant, really.
when we were on top of the mountain, we actually used our own torches. And then there was a period when we said, right, let's put the torches out and let's just be still for a while and look around and listen. As much as we could, we tried to uh, establish if there was anything at all unusual up there. Four miles away in the village of Hlenderfell, another vehicle headed up to the mountains in search of a crashed aircraft. The occupants travelled to a peak called Kader Berwin and looked across the range toward the mountain the police were searching, Kader Bromwin. District nurse Pat Evans had taken her first aid trained daughters with her in case anyone needed medical assistance. Although she didn't find a plane wreck, Pat Evans did see something else. In 1974, she gave a statement which described seeing a perfect round circle, like a red bonfire, with lights moving around it, changing color to yellow and back again. On the mountain opposite, the police search for the crashed aircraft had drawn a blank. It was with a great degree of disappointment that we came back down uh, from Cadet Bronwyn, having found nothing. Whatever had happened that night was still a mystery. By the following morning in Flandrichlo, News of what the villagers had experienced had sparked a media frenzy. But no one had spoken to Pat Evans, and there was no talk of UFOs. Hello again. A remote area of North Wales was shaken by a mysterious explosion during the night, and no one yet knows why. It's a greenish-blue colour. I was standing just by the police station there when he went just, just over the, there. What, did it, what was it? Was it a streak or a, or a flash? Yeah, or it was a streak. It was just coming down. The whole house was shaking, you know, trembling underneath somewhere. What did you think was happening? No idea what was happening. We were all stunned for a few seconds. The villagers were keen to find out whether there was a rational explanation for the streaking lights. Experts have been trying to establish all day long whether the explosion was caused by a falling meteorite. Astronomer Dr. Ron Madison was the first scientist on the scene in Flandrichlo. We were at home listening to the late radio news and there was an account of an explosion followed by great flashes in the sky and it happened only about 50 miles from where we were living and it occurred to me being an astronomer by training, oh, this is probably a landed meteorite. Joined by colleagues from the astronomy department at Keele University, Dr. Madison launched a search for what he thought may have crashed onto the mountain. Not the plane that the police were looking for, but a meteorite. We went up into the mountains and spent the whole day hoofing it around uh, in a big area because the precision of the direction from which the lights had appeared was not very great. The situation was complicated by the fact that the weather was not that clear and there was light snow about. It was really a bit unpleasant. This is where it's thought the meteorite landed, but looking for it is like looking for a needle in a haystack because these Berwyn Mountains cover hundreds of square miles and is possibly the most remote, isolated part of Wales. Madison and his team of astronomers spent four days combing the mountain for evidence of a meteorite impact. Two Canberra surveillance aircraft from the nearby Valley Air Force Base helped in the search. I thought it would be a good shot to get the Air Force team in Anglesey there at Valley to do a photographic survey. And they agreed and did a whole survey of uh, the mountain range. 
Whilst the astronomers scoured the mountain for evidence of a meteorite, the police and an RAF rescue team continued to search for a crashed aircraft. But neither hunt was successful. No physical evidence that anything had hit the mountain was found. No one knew what had caused the ground to shake so violently. It was quite a sensation, I can tell you. The house seems to lift, you know, quite slowly, really. And then it felt as the floor was giving away as well, you see. So it's sort of a parting, really. The whole house rattled, basically. And I said, I think a steamroller's hit the house. I ran out and there was nothing there, except for a small garage. And the mechanic was stood in the middle of the road with his spanner and he couldn't speak. He was totally speechless and ashen white. And he said, good God, he says, what happened there? And I said, I don't know. We liaised with um, the Department of Geology in Edinburgh University within a day or so of this, uh, this event being investigated. And they were able to confirm that there had been a very, very substantial earth tremor. The British Geological Survey's observatory had measured a quake with a magnitude of 3.5 on the Richter scale. The epicenter was just a mile from Klandrichla. The earth tremor explained the shaking ground and could also have been responsible for the explosive sound. In all British earthquakes, often people say that the, 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 the sound is more terrible than the shaking. What happens is that when these shock waves reach the surface of the Earth, a certain amount of them um, change from being shock waves travelling through the ground to shock waves travelling through the air as sound. So what you get is a booming sound or a rumbling sound. These are often very widely reported. The villagers and police now had concrete evidence that it was an earthquake that had shaken their homes. But with the searches on the mountain drawing a blank, nothing had yet explained the lights they had witnessed above the Berwyn. It clearly wasn't a crashed aircraft, or evidence would have been found, so we can rule that out with safety. I don't think it actually was a meteorite that actually crashed to Earth because you would expect to find some evidence of that, a crater or whatever. That simply left, as far as my uh, experience was concerned, the green lights. Later, evidence emerged that could have explained the arcing lights. The Royal Astronomical Society had tracked a meteor shower heading eastward across northern Britain. We got letters in the, in the following days from all parts of the country. People who claimed to have seen uh, shooting stars which were very, very bright. There were at least three, possibly four sightings of bolide meteors that night over a three hour period. Very, very unusual. Uh, and, and therefore that also adds to the mystery factor because one, you could say, well, that was strange, but probably something in the sky. Two, three and four, you think, well, what's happening? This is going on all night and there's been this huge explosion and rumbling. Surely they must be connected. That night's events were slowly consigned to memory. But in the 1980s, the Berwyn shot to prominence again when district nurse Pat Evans gave an interview to a UFO enthusiast. When her description of the strange lights over the bear wind was made public, UFO investigators took a renewed interest in the events of January the 23rd. Over the last 30 years, Jenny Randalls has investigated thousands of UFO sightings. She has looked closely at the bear wind case. When the district nurse came forward with her story, the case had really lay in limbo for 
about 10 or 15 years. Even within the UFO community, nobody was taking it seriously. It had died a death, effectively. Uh, suddenly, her story, when she gave it, resurrected the entire case because at last we had an eyewitness who was describing something that appeared to be more than just a light and, more importantly, something that was actually on the ground. Nurse Evans gave a statement to the British Geological Survey in 1974 which only came to light in the 1980s. UFO skeptic Andy Roberts has examined it in detail. These pieces of information were gathered within a couple of days, a couple of weeks at most, of the actual event. So it's contemporary evidence, first hand, taken at interview and written down. I've met her and interviewed her, she's a very down-to-earth practical person and I believe that what she says she saw, she saw whatever that was and, and you know, that's the crux of the matter. Pat Evans described a stationary light like a bonfire on the hillside. The revelations that came to public attention in the 1980s placed Pat Evans at the centre of the Berwyn UFO mystery. She is now tired of the attention and moved abroad. Nurse Evans doesn't want to discuss this business for the simple reason and for the last 30 years the poor lady's been continually hassled by people who look for UFOs and aliens and the likes to all those kind of people and to those who disbelieve all those kind of things. And she's had the two types on her doorstep arguing with her and basically telling her what she saw wasn't true. Unlike his near neighbor, Pat Evans, after 34 years of silence, Geraint Edwards is willing to talk about his close encounter. It happened on the western side of the Berwyn just three weeks after the nurse's sighting. The retired gamekeeper has no doubt that what he saw was otherworldly. We were on the way down to play darts, and something took our eye in the southeast, and uh, we stopped. Well, it looked like a rocket ball, but the ends of it was more pointy. All red, standing in the same place, probably about 60, 100 foot above the horizon of the mountain. How long it had been there before, we had no idea, like, no. But when it took off, it just went, well, like lightning, on the same line as it hovered, back of the mountain, and gone. Geraint has been keeping weather records for the Meteorological Office for 40 years. He keeps a journal in Welsh and wrote up his UFO encounter at the time. I put it down in the diary, yes. And uh, not thinking probably I'd be on television in for 30 odd years talking about it, I, I, you know. You know, it was, I say, quarter to seven on the Friday night. Probably, if we were coming home from the pub, people were, would be, oh, they've had one or two, or, you know, but this was going to the pub. It's definitely a flying saucer. Fantastic. It's a pity I didn't have a camera or something. You, you had the time to photograph it, because it was there for at least 10 minutes, just hovering. No photographic or other physical evidence exists of the Berwyn sightings, but one more recent British encounter has been caught on camera. Shot in 2000 and never shown before, could this be evidence of an extraterrestrial craft? Oh, it's get, it, oh dear. You think I'm bloody daft, but this is a UFO. The proliferation of domestic camcorders and mobile phones means that unlike the sightings on the Berwyn Mountains in 1974, more recent close encounters are much more likely to be captured on camera. 
In October 2000, Sharon Rowlands was at home in Bonsall, Derbyshire, watching TV when something outside caught her eye. Oh dear! You think I'm bloody daft, but this is a UFO. Oh, it's gone all funny! It's spinning! Inside the disc, it got you could see like lines around it, as if it was in segments, with a, um, a dark centre to it. But it's moving slightly to the right, and it is slightly. It's getting bigger. I would think the object was maybe as big as a, a detached house or slightly bigger than that, because at one stage we did think it was going to land in the field in front of us, and that made me feel very, very nervous. It's now gone like a saucer. And then it looked as if engines from where this bite is was starting up, turns and then it just blinks out, it just disappears. I've never seen anything move as quickly as that. It didn't move slowly like an aircraft that you can see disappearing into the night. It just went, it just just completely disappeared. It's moving. Oh, it's going. Wow, it's... There one minute, gone the next. Days after she'd filmed it, Sharon allowed a still from the video to appear in her local newspaper. She was shocked at the reaction. Like Pat Evans in Berwyn, going public with the UFO sighting made her life more difficult. The ball just rolled and escalated to we'd got everyone knocking on doors, following me, ringing up. It really got quite scary. So we then put the tape uh, at the solicitors in a vault to keep it safe. So uh, that's where it stayed until now. I wasn't prepared to be called a liar. I'm not a liar. What you see is what you get. What's on the film is genuine. I can't tell you what it is. I have no idea. But UFO is the correct term for what's on that tape. Impartial analysis of Sharon's tape by an expert in the field of visual effects suggests there may be more to it than at first meets the eye. We can fake anything. If you have the right equipment and the expertise, it's possible to make any image appear real. And certainly if we look forensically at footage, we can usually find some clue. The pattern in the area seems very constant. That would suggest we're seeing it from one orientation that is not moving at all in the sky. When we see the object in more detail, a bit closer up, there's one slightly strange part of it, which is underneath it. There appears to be a little semicircular dark area. The most likely reason for that is actually that there's a pole or column supporting the structure. There is some implied image in that grain structure going down that suggests to me there is a column there. I think it's a street lamp of some description. Definitely not a light stuck on a pole. That would be absolutely ridiculous. There's no way that that could move in and out that quickly. It, it was so large as well. No, definitely not a light on a pole. It was a very clear night, no clouds. Um, you could see the stars. There was no sound, nothing. It was just very calm, very quiet, very dark. Um, there are no um, houses across the valley, so there's no street lights, no house lights, and there's no road, so there is no light whatsoever. So when we saw this object, it did stick out very well in the background of the dark skies. Some UFO sightings have never been fully explained, but for others, the answers can often lie close to home. Over the 30 years I've investigated somewhere in the region of 10,000 UFO sightings and according to my own figures I'm satisfied that about 95% of those have been explained as what we call IFOs, identified flying objects. It's easy to assume from an account by a witness that they saw something 
out of this world, when in truth, very often in the UFO phenomenon, the solution is very much of this world. Most recently, the trend towards releasing Chinese lanterns at summer barbecues has prompted concerned members of the public to telephone the police to report squadrons of UFOs crossing Britain's skies. I've had UFOs that turned out to be hats blowing in the wind. I've even had one case of a reported alien in a shopping centre, which turned out to be a dog that had escaped from a circus and had run off through a pond and was wandering around, standing on its legs with its hair all matted, and had terrified one or two people who I suspect were a little bit worse for the wear at the time. People see unexplained lights in the sky on a regular basis. We live in a world where people don't really have the first idea about what's in the sky. People are very um, ignorant uh, of, of astronomical phenomena, celestial phenomena, meteorological phenomena. I mean, I, I've seen several lights in the sky that I haven't got a clue what they are, but that doesn't imply any mysterious origin. It just implies that you've seen something you don't understand. When it comes to the Berwyn incident, could it be that in 1974, district nurse Pat Evans simply misinterpreted the lights she saw? Skeptics suggest that what she was in fact looking at was the police searching for a crashed aircraft and a group of poachers, all of whom were standing three miles away on the mountain opposite called Cadair Bronwyn. The large light Pat Evans described as an orb the size of the moon has been credited to the powerful lamp used by poachers when they hunt at night. When I spoke to Pat, she told me that she was looking across the, across the hillside and she could see this, this unusual large light. And she said round it were what she could only describe as fairy lights, little lights twinkling, as well as some what looked to be car headlights. What Pat Evans saw is the police and the Land Rovers and the farmer with their torches meeting the poachers. Sheep farmer Yian Roberts was one of the poachers that night and has his own views about the lamp theory. I was in charge of the lamp. It was a spot lamp which we adapted to put a halogen bulb in. Um, that would give you like a pencil beam, but nothing else. Um, and I doubt if it looks anything like the moon kind of thing. Um, I wouldn't have thought that. According to Yian, the poachers had stopped hunting by the time the police arrived. And what Pat Evans saw was definitely not a poacher's lamp. Then, of course, we were coming down and the vehicles coming up. So we hopped over the hedge. Not that we'd really done anything wrong, but it's unusual uh, that time of night for vehicles to be going up the road. And we recognised the Land Rover, and we recognised the shape of a police officer uh, sitting in the passenger seat of one of them. And we were starting to wonder now what's going on. There is another theory that might explain what Pat Evans saw that night. Earthquakes are often accompanied by lights which rise up from within the ground so-called earth lights. The fact that earthquakes are known from reports all over the world to generate energy that can create earth lights in the sky still remains at the back of my mind a possibility in this case. I do think there is a chance that some of the things that were seen directly over the area where this fault line was activated that night were earth lights. Actually, this is a fairly common experience. It's not understood fully, but when you get blocks of rock, which are made of something like quartz, and they move and they're under huge pressure, and there's a sliding of the rocks, this generates a voltage by the piezoelectric effect. And it can run into thousands of volts. And if gas is squeezed out from that fault as well, which is commonplace, that gas would be ionized, it would glow, and you'd get a big glow in the sky, like lightning, but not the flash, not an arc. During Jenny Randall's investigations into the Bowen case, she claims to have witnessed light emanating from the ground, which would fit exactly the same description. 
On one of the occasions when I was actually there doing this investigation, I was quite surprised to see one of these Earth lights for myself. It was emerging from within the rocks itself and climbing into the sky. But if that was an Earth light and that was what was seen on the night of this particular occasion, I can well understand why the much greater forces that might have been involved at the time of an earthquake would have generated huge glowing lights that would have been of, of great fascination to the local people and why they would have thought that they'd seen something very strange indeed. With explanations for the lights seen in the sky resting on the edge of known scientific fact, and no concrete evidence to fully explain all of the events of that night in 1974, the Berwyn UFO has become shrouded in rumours of government cover-up. As time went on, uh, the rumours seemed to gather a pace, and we got to a stage where people who related very well to the police in this area in the nicest possible way would be saying things like we understand you can't tell us everything what with the official secrets act and all that whatever it was it was kept quiet and you know, I think there's things we should know about and that you know things that happened that have been covered up could the Ministry of Defence have covered up the Berwyn case? Nick Pope worked on their UFO investigation desk for three years. The Ministry of Defence actually takes an interest in all UFO sightings because by implication they are potentially unauthorised intrusions of the United Kingdom Air Defence Region. Where you have uh, mass waves of sightings. Uh, the MOD, like any other organisation, would probably think, well, there's no smoke without fire, something's going on here. So did the Berwyn case attract the attention of the fabled men in black? Smart-suited men from the Ministry are dispatched to fact-find after a reported UFO sighting. We were watching a couple of so-called educated people coming along to find out what we had heard or seen. Over the years, uh, people from the MOD did go and visit UFO witnesses to take details of their sightings. And uh, I suppose if two people in smart suits turn up on your doorstep and uh, say we're from the government and take details of your report uh, and go away, it's easy to see how that can evolve into a story about sinister men in black. It may well be that in the case of the Berwyn, it wasn't men in black at all who were speaking to local witnesses. The British Geological Survey sent seismologists to Hlandrichlo in the weeks following the earthquake. Well, the interesting thing about the men in black is that the men in black were actually seismologists. Four of my colleagues uh, went down to North Wales and they asked people, how strongly did you feel the earthquake? And um, apparently um, some UFO investigators uh, some years later um, found out that these mysterious strangers had appeared in the village and uh, said, aha, the men in black have been at work. Well, in this case, I had great delight in actually going to my former colleagues, uh, they, they've all retired now, and say, did you know that you were a man in black? In May 2008, the government released previously unseen UFO case files. Would they provide any more clues to the Bearwind incident? There's been in the papers recently a big flurry about the government allegedly releasing all these new documents. Now, there was great excitement. People thought there's going to be things in about Berwyn. I'm afraid there isn't. The information should have been released. It's still not been released, and therefore that throws more intrigue on it again as to why not. Um, what are they hiding? Is there anything to hide? The Berwyn UFO case has been beset by conspiracy theories, and one in particular stands out. If the events of that night in 1974 were naturally occurring, then why was there a large military deployment into the area? 
Hill farmer Yayan Roberts knows every inch of the Berwyn Mountains. He's lived and farmed on them all his life. Yayan remembers seeing a lot of military activity in the days and weeks following the reported UFO. After we finished with the chores in the morning, uh, we were looking across the valley. We could see the army uh, as if they were going to search the area. Uh, starting off at the woods and facing up towards the summit um, in rows so many meters apart. Um, and it was, we arrived at the conclusion they were the army. Who else would they be? Firefighter Adrian Roberts recalls that the mountain was virtually a no-go area. There was a lot of military action in the area. Areas were secluded off for the public. It was about three months before anyone was allowed to go anywhere near the site. But skeptic Andy Roberts isn't convinced the locals are remembering the facts exactly as they occurred. The following morning, a three-man team arrived from RAF Valley, a mountain rescue team. The fact that they'd left their military vehicles in the, in the village has given rise to um, some people thinking that there was a huge military presence there the day after and that the military presence was collecting this crashed UFO. And all these various separate elements have become melded together by the media to a certain extent, certainly by some ufologists, into the crash of an extraterrestrial craft. And the story is then extended to the point where some people even believe that they've, um, that they've got a piece of metal in, the, in their basement belonging to the craft. Other people say that they've spoken to members of the crash retrieval uh, crew and so on and so forth. Fantastic stories, you know, wonderful mythology, but there's no evidence. In 1974, newspapers reported that soldiers had been seen removing boxes from the mountain. And Berwyn's military mystery deepened in 1996 when a soldier using the pseudonym of James Prescott made a claim in UFO magazine. He said that he'd been part of a unit that had removed two dead aliens from the mountains to the UK's most secret military research base, Porton Down. Skeptics have their doubts. That simply made me smile because the, it's, it's so improbable. There would be serious practical difficulties with it. Had the, the British government found an alien, dead or alive, do you really think that they'd actually put it in a box and drove it to Porton Down? They'd have had a helicopter there straight away. It had been there within a couple of hours instead of a very bumpy, rickety ride down a mountain and then a very risky drive down the motorway. And apparently at one point they even stopped and went to a motorway service station. Now, you know, they don't even do that when they're conveying prisoners. You go straight from A to B. So an alien you just wouldn't arrive at Porton Down like that. Despite the inherently secretive nature of the Ministry of Defence, uh, people of course do chat and gossip to their uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, all I can say is that in my 21 years working there, three years of which were actually working on the UFO issue, I never once picked up even the slightest hint uh, from anyone else in the MOD that uh, behind my back there had been this secret UFO project, uh, dead extraterrestrials um, secreted away at Porton Down or wherever. Not, not a hint, not a whisper. Whether you believe the conspiracy theorists or the skeptics, what the locals of Llandrichlo saw that night may never be fully explained. It was a highly unusual event, unsatisfactory in the, in the sense that it, it can't be put to bed, as it were, with a rational explanation and evidence to support that. All the evidence, as documented by the police, the British Geological Society, points to it being a series of natural phenomena which all happened on the same night. Fantastic coincidence, you know, I mean, what are the chances of that happening? But it did, and people have spun from that a mythology which has led to um, it being a crashed saucer. I thought, probably, it, w it wouldn't happen to me to see something like that. But definitely it did happen to me that night in February 1974. What people have seen and reported and collected just simply could not be made up. So, in some ways, we've got to try and believe them, haven't we? What is special about the Earth? 
absolutely nothing. Eventually we will get evidence that shows that there is intelligent life somewhere outside the Earth. I promise you that with absolute certainty. Britain's Closest Encounter is back next week with the Broad Haven Triangle. Next tonight, the new series of Extraordinary People continues with Sherry, who's one of the world's first cyborgs. She has bionic vision and likes to be called the Robotic. <laughs>